Subcommittee will come to order. And good morning. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Blumenauer, and to all our witnesses as well, and, and members for being here today. Today's subcommittee hearing is an important step as the House Ways and Means Committee considers updates to custom laws to ensure customs and border protection has the right policies in place to enforce our laws effectively, facilitate, le facilitate legitimate trade, and provide clarity to the private sector. Congress has periodically made meaningful updates to customs laws. However, it has been 30 years since our last comprehensive overhaul. In the three dec decades since, we have seen the emergence of e-commerce, major supply chain challenges, many of which stemmed from a global pandemic, changes in consumer behavior, and the rise of China as a much larger player in global trade. Congress must do more to secure our key supply chains, modernize how and with whom we trade, and hold China accountable for its abusive trade practices. I'm eager for this committee to lead a thoughtful process to consider updates that reflect our current reality, and we're off to a strong start. Earlier this month, the full committee held a hearing, a field hearing, at the port in Staten Island, New York, to better understand challenges Americans face moving goods through ports every day. As part of our continued effort, we must also examine how best to give law enforcement the tools needed to stop illicit products like fentanyl, from entering the U.S. Likewise, we must take steps to prevent products made with forced labor from entering the U.S., all while supporting American jobs and improving American competitiveness. I'm convinced we can advance a bipartisan legislative product that minimizes unnecessary red tape when importing and exporting, addresses supply chain bottlenecks while holding China accountable, and stops illegal, often dangerous, products from crossing our borders. Both CBP and private sector partners play pivotal roles in targeting bad actors abroad. Last year, Congress appropriated $100 million for CBP to enforce the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. These increased resources must lead to fair and effective enforcement and improved clarity on what information CBP requires to determine a supply chain is free of forced labor. This subcommittee will continue to provide robust oversight on this front. Recently, there have there have been substantial discussions about de minimis policies and how to ensure they function as intended. It is always appropriate to review our policies and consider whether updates are needed. As Trade Subcommittee Chair, I'm committed to ensuring this conversation considers both the benefits and challenges of de minimis in the world today. I must also express my deep concern about the White House's repeated attempts to exclude Congress from key trade actions. This approach to trade only emboldens China while ignoring the wishes, the wishes of the American people. While multiple administrations have pushed the envelope by seeking to advance trade negotiations through executive agreements rather than seeking approval from Congress, the Biden administration has vastly overstepped its authority. Most recently, this administration has taken unprecedented action to re redefine what a, trade, a free trade agreement is for, and I quote, critical mineral agreements, end quote. These agreements do nothing to create U.S. jobs or reduce our reliance on China. There has been growing bipartisan recognition that Congress must assert our constitutional authority over international trade. And I am pleased to work with Ranking Member Blumenauer and other colleagues on this important issue. I look forward to working with my colleagues to examine all sides of complex customs issues. Our work must result in policies that make the U.S. as competitive as possible by improving trade enforcement and expanding opportunities for American workers, both in the near and long term. With that, I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And there are a number of things that you outlined there that I think we can and should uh, work on uh, on a cooperative basis, uh, particularly the role of Congress in dealing uh, with trade policy. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. I've been looking forward to this conversation, even though we're going to maybe be running back and forth a little bit from the floor. Uh, this hearing follows a similar hearing we had just a few weeks ago in Staten Island on the topic of securing supply chains and protecting the American worker. We heard compelling testimony about the presence of forced labor in our supply chains, the pernicious role of the de minimis loophole, and the impact of unfair trade practices on American workers and business. And I'm looking forward to hearing our witness elaborate on some of these points. Now, I'm proud of what the Trade Subcommittee Democrats came up with in terms of proposals to accomplish 
the objectives laid out in that hearing. I hope that we can move uh, from talking about it to uh, having further action to achieve our shared goals. Last Congress, House Democrats led efforts to pass the American Competes Act to support America's workers and combat China's unfair trade practices. That legislation strengthens American trade laws, closes the diminutive threshold, and invests in American workers. I'm, I'm sorry we were unable to uh, pull those across the finish line. I hope that it, working together we can identify areas to deal with these challenges, maintaining Americans competitive. I, as you know, have had particular interest in the de minimis loophole. It's allowed imports from China to flood the American market, evade oversight and duties at the border, and undercut American companies that play by the rules. More than two million packages a day now in the United States under de minimis. The vast majority of those shipments originate from China. I appreciated Chairman Jason Smith's comments at the field hearing in Staten Island, noting that de minimis is like a free trade agreement for China. We must be bold in closing this loophole that puts American jobs in danger and creates an open for trade in illicit products. Many of these de minimis shipments contain textiles apparel, a source highly exposed to forced labor by the Uyghur people in Xinjiang, China. The de minimis loophole can allow evasion of our trade laws that prohibit importation of goods made with forced labor, including the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. President Biden and Ways and Means Democrats have championed the enforcement of trade laws, including the Forced Labor Prevention Act, because we believe the fruits of modern-day slavery have no place in supply chains of any product anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that my colleagues across the aisle are pursuing policies that would undermine the Enforcement Trade Act to the development of American workers. The Republican proposal to slash the budgets of the federal government that administer and enforce trade laws that protect American industries and workers by as much as 22 percent. At a time when U.S. Customs and Border Protection faces unprecedented trade enforcement work workloads, we should be investing more, not less, in the investment of our trade laws. I look forward to working with CPB and making sure the agency has the resources it needs to properly administer um, American de minimis laws and any reform that we come up with. I strongly urge my colleagues to come forward with meaning trading proposals to ensure U.S. workers, farmers, and businesses have the tools to compete in the global economy. U.S. Customs and Border Protection has embarked on an endeavor to update our customs laws to meet today's framework through the 21st century customs framework. The agency has worked closely with industry stakeholders to come up with legislative proposals to reform customs laws. Unfortunately, some of those ideas we've heard about would actually weaken trade enforcement. For that reason, I've worked with Mr. Doggett to urge CPB to oppose an industry proposal to shield vehicle manifest data from public disclosure. As we wrote in our letter, civil society organizations rely on this data to assist CPB with enforcing U.S. prohibition on the import of labor, for example, made with forced labor, and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. We should consider how we can make more information available to increase transparency in supply chains. This committee has watched this in terms of uh, illegal trade in animals and illegal logging. We should not hide this critical information. Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record that Mr. Doggett and I had generated on this issue. Without objection. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on these issues as we consider proposals to update the customs laws and procedures and hope that Congress facilitates that, not makes it harder. I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, this hearing and look forward to working with you on areas of common interest and perhaps analyzing areas where we may find development of some common ground. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. I will now introduce our witnesses. Brenda Smith is the Global Director of Government Outreach for Expeditors International and is the former Executive Assistant Commissioner at CBP. Next we have Michael Kenko, the CEO of Import Genius. Next is 
Fred Ferguson, the Vice President of Public Affairs for Vista Outdoor. Michael Stumo is CEO for Coalition for a Prosperous America. Finally, Martina Vandenberg, founder and president of Human Trafficking Legal Center. Thank you to all of our witnesses for taking your time and sharing your expertise here today. I will remind all of you that your written statement will become part of the record. And Ms. Smith, I recognize you now for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Blumenauer, members of the committee, thank you for the chance to testify before you today. My name is Brenda Smith, and I currently work as the Global Director of Government Outreach for Expeditors International of Washington, a global logistics, freight forwarding, and information company. Previously, I served for seven years as the Executive Assistant Commissioner for Trade at U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the position of my current or past employers. The pandemic laid bare the weaknesses in the global system that moves goods from farmers and manufacturers to consumers. In the 40 years that I have worked in this arena, the volume of global trade has multiplied 32 times what it was in the mid-1980s. This staggering growth has been accompanied by an overlay of new trade agreements, expanded supply chain parties, and increased customer expectations. Customs administrations have also evolved over those 40 years, mostly in response to border security challenges, leaving many trade modernization efforts unfinished. In my work on the U.S. single window, I learned the importance of developing a clear vision and then translating this vision into legal, operational, and technology frameworks. My own statement of principles underlying a vision for customs modernization would include the following points. First, leveraging trusted trader investment to share risk information and truly streamline entry and compliance procedures by all U.S. government regulatory agencies. Make the green lane a reality across all types of shipments and trade processes. This approach should extend to expansion and full implementation of AEO mutual recognition agreements. Second, truly digitizing all agency requirements for supply chains, including a commitment to a continued commitment to the U.S. single window and a full rationalization of data requirements to minimize redundancy and focus on collecting only the most important data at the right time from the right party. More data isn't always better. Quality is more important than quantity. Third, planning and practicing a response to supply chain disruption across all government agencies and their supply chain partners. Resiliency will be greater if potential regulatory and operational flexibilities are determined in advance and recognize the lower risk associated with trusted traders. And finally, a single process across all agencies with requirements for good crossing borders to include the alignment of regulations, operational processes, and trusted trader programs, and a commitment to using the U.S. single window for the collection of all data. So what will it take to implement this vision? There are many things that could be included, but I'd like to highlight two specific areas. First the investment in customs personnel and technology, and second, collaboration with stakeholders. First, implementation will require ongoing investment in the softer parts of customs infrastructure, specifically expertise and technology. Aside from significant investment in forced labor capabilities, the level of CBP's non-uniformed trade personnel has not materially increased since CBP was established in 2003. In addition to ensuring that there are enough specialists to handle the growth in trade and complexity, these individuals need to be well-trained in both modern business practice and traditional customs competencies with a dedicated trade and cargo academy and regularly updated curriculum. Investment in technology will support data collection and analysis for enforcement and facilitation and must prioritize the continued modernization of the automated commercial environment. 
The second key requirement for modernization is collaboration with stakeholders. At CBP, I worked extensively with numerous partners and valued forums that allowed for frank discussion and consensus building. Expanding private sector engagement with the partner government agencies through the Border Interagency Executive Council and driving active regulatory, operational, and technology coordination through forums like the COAC, the Trade Support Network, and the BIEC would result in better problem solving and an environment that meets the needs of both government and the private sector. I thank this committee for the opportunity to advocate for customs modernization. Much work remains to be done, but I strongly believe it is, worth, it is work worth pursuing as we support opportunities for businesses and consumers as they engage in the global marketplace. Thank you. Mr. Kenko, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Blumenauer, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael Kanko, and I am the CEO and founder of Import Genius, a leading provider of supply chain intelligence to the global trade community. We transform raw shipping manifest data from U.S. Customs into usable information for the trade community and the general public. Since 2007, Import Genius has helped make the global supply chain more efficient and more transparent by making shipment records from 17 countries, including the United States, easily searchable and user-friendly. This data includes shipping details such as the name of the importer, the name of the overseas exporter, a description of the products, the port of entry, the ocean carrier, and the shipment dates. Our platform helps companies improve their supply chains and global competitiveness while aiding regulatory compliance. We help government facilitate trade, stimulate commercial activity, and enforce trade laws. And we help investigative journalists and NGOs uncover forced labor and keep consumers safe from counterfeit goods and save lives from deadly illicit drugs like fentanyl. As Congress considers customs modernization and customs and border protection continues its work, through the 21st century customs framework, I urge you to increase supply chain transparency by requiring the publication of air data. Today I want to share a few examples that demonstrate why this change is so important. The Import Genius platform has uncovered forced labor from China in the supply chain of products like laptops, refrigerators, rubber gloves, and even human hair. We have even helped law enforcement identify drugs smuggled into the country in shipments of bananas. Earlier this year, we helped identify imports of weapons and body armor from China to Russia used to support their war effort. And earlier this month, our platform helped journalists track Russian sanctions violations related to shipments of aircraft parts and gold. These examples represent only a fraction of the overwhelming evidence that makes one thing clear. We all benefit from robust supply chain transparency. But unfortunately, CBP currently only publishes maritime shipping data. Manifests for cargo arriving by air or by land remain in the dark, despite air and truck cargo representing 43% of U.S. import value. By failing to publish air and land data, we're missing nearly half the picture, including many important and high-value products such as pharmaceuticals, which are shipped by air. Earlier this year, Bloomberg News reported on the deaths of 20 children in Uzbekistan related to tainted cough syrup that was manufactured in India. Import Genius trade data from India's government was used to track air shipments of the tainted products to Uzbekistan. Additional shipments bound for other countries were discovered on our platform and this critical information was relayed to the World Health Organization to help prevent further deaths. Increased transparency can literally save lives, but the current visibility gap in U.S. air shipping data makes it harder to keep American consumers safe. This gap is also impacting our ability to stop Chinese forced labor. Many of the goods sourced from China that appear on the U.S. government's list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor are typically shipped by air. 
American companies are trying to give up, or trying to clean up their supply chains. Expanding transparency to air cargo will give them the insights they need to do that important work. Import Genius also cares about privacy. Personal information sometimes gets mixed into commercial trade data. And that's why in addition to increased transparency requirements, we also support the bipartisan Moving Americans Privacy Prevention Act, which recently passed the Senate by unanimous consent. This bill will help address those concerns. I'll close by reminding the committee that supply chain transparency is the number one goal of the 21st century customs framework. Public disclosure of air data would help stop human rights abuses in China and around the world, save lives from fentanyl, and dramatically improve our understanding of global trade. Import Genius urges Congress to advance legislation requiring the publication of air data on the exact same terms that CBP publishes maritime trade data today. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. You, you are recognized for five minutes. Hey, good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Blumenhauer, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Fred Ferguson, and I serve as Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications for Vista Outdoor. I am grateful for the chance to testify. Vista Outdoor is a leading designer, manufacturer, and marketer of outdoor recreation products. Vista Outdoor is comprised of 41 iconic brands, including Bell Helmets, Camelback, Fox Racing, Sims Fishing, Quiet Cat, and many, many more. We are headquartered in Anoka, Minnesota, and employ more than 6,000 people across 16 states and Puerto Rico. We are a mission-driven company founded on the belief that when we do well, we can do good. This mindset drives our business actions. Over the past three years, we've invested more than $1 billion acquiring new outdoor companies. We have a robust compliance program, and we've dedicated funding to conservation and public lands access through the Vista Outdoor Foundation. We appreciate the subcommittee for holding today's hearing. Despite the surge of consumer demand for outdoor gear during the pandemic, our industry is not immune to today's larger macroeconomic challenges. Combined with foreign online sellers and distributors who enjoy a significant competitive advantage in direct-to-consumer sales, the status quo is challenging on many fronts. My testimony will focus on three critical issues that require congressional leadership. Number one, par providing parity to U.S. foreign trade zones. Number two, renewal of GSP. And number three, updating the competitive needs limit provision within GSP. We operate within an FTZ in Rantoul, Illinois. Here we manufacture children's bicycle helmets and distribute a variety of other bicycle products, including tire pumps, safety lights, and more. Over the last three years, we produced over 7 million helmets in our US FTZ, employing over 100 manufacturing personnel. Our FTZ is not utilized to its fullest potential. The lack of parity for US FTZs on the issue of de minimis entry prevents us from expanding direct-to-consumer distribution in Rand Tool and many of our other US locations. FTZs are not eligible for de minimis entry because of the interpretation of a single word from a 1930s era statute. This means we're losing ground to competitors who enjoy up to 60% in duty and tax savings by foreign online sellers or companies in Mexico, Canada, or other foreign locations. Congress obviously didn't intend to exclude FTZs from e-commerce benefits. The current statute was written decades before the invention of the personal computer. FTZs have other benefits, especially in the context of illicit imports from China. Concentrating DTC distribution across our country's networks of FTZs can support CBP efforts to enforce trade laws, protect IP, and promote safety. US FTZs are some of the most highly regulated entities in the country. Allowing de minimis entry for products withdrawn from US FTZs is a ready-made solution to secure supply chains and promote American jobs. By contrast, CBP has no oversight of the foreign warehouses where de minimis shipments currently originate and where no Americans are employed. There are 197 US FTZs located within all 50 states. They employ over 480,000 Americans and should be used as a tool to better manage shipments coming into the United States. Lastly, we've seen de minimis used to skirt excise tax payments on certain fishing and archery equipment. This short changes conservation programs and disadvantages companies who play by the rules. 
Congress should also pass a full retroactive renewal of GSP. GSP incentivizes U.S. companies to diversify their supply chains away from China while boosting the economies of developing countries who otherwise may fall under the influence of other global adversaries. Congressional inaction has contributed to inflation, costing U.S. companies over $2.5 billion and consumers even more at the retail level. Congress should also update the competitive needs limit provision within GSP. Inflation has driven up the cost of production and triggered certain CNL thresholds for many products. Artificially low CNL thresholds cut countries off just as they are starting to build domestic industries capable of competing with China. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. In summary, parity for FTZs, renewal of GSP, and updates to CNLs would create certainty and give U.S. companies confidence to invest in domestic operation, strengthen supply chains, diversify, and feel confident that U.S. policy will not fundamentally shift as the political winds change. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stumo, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Blumenauer, and members of this committee, it's an honor to testify here today. My name is Michael Stumo. I'm the CEO of the Coalition for a Prosperous America. CPA is proud to be the leading national bipartisan organization representing exclusively domestic producers and workers across many industries and sectors of the U.S. economy. De minimis, also known as the Amazon loophole, is a serious flaw in customs law that allows over 2 million packages per day to enter the U.S. without meaningful inspection, tariffs, country of origin information, or HTS codes. Historically, it was a very minor exception. Today, shippers that use de minimis have little or no knowledge of what is in the box. The practical effect is to authorize every foreign vendor on planet Earth, completely outside our jurisdiction, the ability to sell directly to American households without any liability. Chairman Jason Smith rightly said de minimis is essentially a free trade agreement with China. Allowing China to exploit de minimis is, in fact, unilateral disarmament of our customs and trade laws. It's another way that China is exploiting U.S. law to further their geopolitical and military rise, while making us weaker by sacrificing American manufacturers and workers. Thankfully, there is bipartisan agreement that this must be fixed. Ranking member Blumenauer led the way with an important bill last year that effectively excludes China from exploiting the de minimis loophole. Many organizations endorsed it, including mine. Several Republican senators supported it. A morning consult poll revealed that an overwhelming 81 percent majority of voters support Congress addressing the de minimis loophole. Former Trade Ambassador Lighthizer said last week that Congress must get rid of de minimis because it supports China and hurts us. Simply lowering it to $200 will do nothing to fix the problem. De minimis is directly harming our CPA members. It undercuts textile producer Parkdale Mills in North Carolina, our, one of our members and the biggest buyer of U.S. cotton. That's because Sheehan now sells billions in clothing directly to U.S. consumers while avoiding our forced labor bans and Section 301 tariffs. De minimis, de minimis hurts CPA member Liberty Tabletop in New York, the only American-made stainless steel silverware manufacturer. That's because Amazon and Timu help Chinese flatware makers sell their products made with subsidized stainless steel and avoid 301 tariffs. De minimis hurts CPA member Kent Bikes in New Jersey and South Carolina, the largest manufacturer of U.S. bikes. That's because Chinese bikes, some with exploding batteries, are shipped individually, avoiding tariffs, avoiding safety inspections that are required of U.S. producers. The de minimis loophole is, loophole is ungovernable lawlessness. CBP itself warned last March that the overwhelming volume of small packages and lack of actionable data impacts CBP's ability to identify and interdict high-risk shipments that may contain narcotics, merchandise that poses a risk to public safety, counterfeits, and other contraband. Over 62 percent of shipments originate in China or Hong Kong. That does not include the Chinese goods moving through Mexican and Canadian warehouses that are shipped here. Counterfeit goods are rampant, with more than 90 percent of seizures coming from international mail and express couriers. The vast majority of seizures are from China. According to official trade figures, China exported 
roughly $532 billion last year to the U.S., which, by the way, is more than the next five Chinese export markets combined. But the value of de minimis shipments is not included because CBP has no idea what the number is. Our CPA economics team, however, estimates that de minimis imports from China hit nearly $188 billion last year. Incredibly, logistic companies in Canada and Mexico actively market our de minimis as a loophole to their, that their vendors should exploit. But Canada does not include, allow incoming de minimis shipments from any countries except the U.S. and Mexico, and none through their postal service. The EU has an effective de minimis level of zero. China is eight bucks. The de minimis loophole has built e-commerce giants, Xi'an and Timu. They are now the most downloaded apps in the U.S. Amazon and its army of Chinese sellers bulldoze through the loophole more every year. CBP tried to figure out a way to get control with pilot programs to collect some data. My written testimony cites CBP's acknowledgement that the results show those efforts have failed. Congress should end the de minimis exception or at a minimum ban China from using it as a weapon against our domestic producers and American workers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vandenberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Blumenauer, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's an honor to testify before you today. My name is Martina Vandenberg, and I'm president of the Human Trafficking Legal Center, a non-governmental, non-profit organization that fights forced labor around the globe. And forced labor today is a feature, not a bug in global supply chains. The International Labor Organization estimates that 27.6 million people are held in forced labor around the globe. Those workers, Uyghurs held in forced labor in factories and internment camps in China, garment workers held in forced labor in sweatshops in Bangladesh, factory workers manufacturing rubber gloves in conditions of forced labor in Malaysia, children held in forced labor producing cocoa, fishers trapped in forced labor on vessels engaged in illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in our oceans, and so many more are producing goods that are imported into the United States every day. There is no way that U.S. workers can compete with workers held in forced labor. To protect American workers, we must eradicate forced labor across the globe. To protect American workers, we must protect all workers. In my written testimony, I discuss four key issues that I'd like to touch on briefly this morning. First, no safe harbor for forced labor. The Human Trafficking Legal Center serves as the secretariat of the Tariff Act, Tariff Act Advisory Group, a coalition of organizations fighting for the enforcement of forced labor import prohibitions. Import bans are powerful tools to combat forced labor. Human rights and, forced lab human rights and labor rights uh, organizations have advocated for robust enforcement of Section 307 of the Tariff Act and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. But we have learned that it is not enough for the United States alone to prohibit the importation of goods made with forced labor into our markets. There should be no forced labor anywhere in the world for goods made with forced labor. Which brings me to my second point, which is enforcement. CBP's robust enforcement efforts have transformed forced labor from a public relations issue to a serious compliance issue. In fiscal year 2022, the United States targeted more than 3,605 shipments valued at $816.5 million under its forced labor enforcement mandate. And the majority of this enforcement, nearly $500 million, was under the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act alone. Unfortunately, these numbers do not reveal the full picture. Only a few hundred shipments were actually denied entry at U.S. ports. In addition, we have also seen a troubling decline in the number of withhold release orders under the Tariff Act Section 307, which prohibits the importation of goods mined, produced, or manufactured by forced labor. In fiscal year 2020, CBP issued 13 withhold release orders. In 2021, seven. In 2022, the number dropped to just six withhold release orders. These dwindling withhold release orders are troubling, especially since we know that multiple forced labor petitions have been pending with CBP for years. Organizations like mine file petitions with CBP to block goods made with forced labor from entering the U.S. market, and we are able to do so because we can submit allegations with low barriers to entry. 
CBP must resist efforts advanced by corporate lobbyists to make it more difficult to petition CBP to block goods under Section 307. We know that CBP is currently investigating more than 40 allegations, and CBP needs funding and resources in order to do that enforcement. Customs data transparency has already been addressed by this panel, but I want to reiterate that we cannot combat forced labor without customs data transparency. The de minimis rule has also been addressed by this panel, and I would also like to reiterate that under current U.S. law, this $800 de minimis, uh, de minimis uh, shipment has allowed goods made with forced labor to circumvent the protections of Section 307, to circumvent Congress's protections against Uyghur forced labor, and those goods are entering the United States. In conclusion, I'd just like to close by bringing the focus back to where it belongs, on workers. Workers in the United States benefit when they do not have to compete against workers held in forced labor in global supply chains. In addition to enforcement of trade remedies, the U.S. should invest in labor rights around the globe, freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining, and worker-driven social responsibility. Together, we can eradicate forced labor around the globe, and Congress has already taken many steps to do so. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you again to all of our witnesses. I think uh, this is uh, helpful information. It's uh, certainly relevant, and I think it's important uh, that we uh, consider all that has been said today. I, I do have concerns that uh, moving forward, uh, we need to have policies that don't unintendedly uh, trigger an increase in cost uh, of goods. And uh, it's and what we've been facing with inflation has been very tough, ultimately, on consumers and the economy. And so I, I hope that we can fashion policies moving forward to acknowledge uh, the realities that, uh, that you mentioned and that we can address those, those issues. I, I do want to, though, um, confirm, though, uh, Ms. Smith, now, the, all shipments, all de minimis shipments, and others, too, are subject to U.S. laws, and CBP does have the authority to take enforcement action when counterfeits or other illicit items are detected. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I do hope that as we do move forward, uh, we can consider things. I, I think uh, knowing that de minimis is a privilege and not a right, uh, perhaps we could look at creating a list of companies uh, that are not permitted to use uh, de minimis uh, based on, on their record. Uh, realizing there's some complexity that uh, would surround that as well and, and want to make sure that it is enforceable. And, and what we do end up with uh, uh, in policy uh, is enforceable. Mr. Ferguson, in your testimony, you share how the GSP program, when it isn't expired, I should add, uh, has uh, several benefits for the American economy. It helps companies diversify global supply chains, aids in French shoring, and most importantly, benefits American companies and consumers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you discuss how the cost of congressional inaction to renew GSP impacts American companies and how it trickles down to consumers? Yeah. Each each quarter that action on GSP is delayed, you know, we are carrying new expenses on the income statement. So cost of goods sold go up, and our ability to to maintain profitability to invest in R and D. To invest in our workforce, to expand, uh, to invest in expansion, is uh, is compromised uh, at the consumer level. Um, you know, there's estimates that, you know, as as a U.S. manufacturer is is hit with higher fees, and in this case, the GSP total is 2.5 billion owed to U.S. companies. Uh, you know, you can see two to three times uh, markup at the retail level. So each quarter, each year that this delay happens, you can see those costs being passed down to the front lines. Thank you very much. Um, I now recognize Ranking Member Mr. Blumenauer for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would just note there's a difference between the authority of customs and the ability. No one doubts that they have the authority, but with two million packages a day and climbing, they don't have the capacity be able to do that. And I would ask each of our witnesses to reflect on a question, and I will follow up with you, because there are currently discussions uh, dealing with the debt 
ceiling that would actually make significant cuts in most of our budgets out of, so reflect on the ability to be able to meet what you're talking about with a reduced budget for Customs and Border Patrol. Um, I, I really appreciate, Mr. Kanko, your observation about what you've been able to do with transparency and arguing that that ought to extend uh, to air freight. There is currently a proposal to actually deny the transparency on, sh on ships via maritime. If we lose that capacity, does that help or hinder the work that you do? Uh, is the we, answer to, to, to not have transparency for maritime shipping? If we lose access to maritime transparency, uh, we'll lose access to all transparency. That, that's the only transparency Thank we you. have. I, I appreciate that. Um, I want to uh, turn, if I could, to Mr. Tumo. In your testimony, you talk about the unfair advantage the de minimis law provides for imports from China that may include goods made with forced labor, intellectual property theft. Can you discuss the limitation of CPB's trade data regarding de minimis shipments? Yeah, there, there is no data. Typically, customs, um, it's, it's the owner the, the, or, or the uh, customs broker. And customs brokers are trained in customs law. They're trained to, to know what's in the package, know what the HTS code is, and to uh, make sure it all complies with our laws, pro pays the proper tariffs, that sort of thing. Uh, there's no relevant data. We don't have country of origin. We don't have the HTS code. All we know is a post office in China sent something, and it came over through postal here, and the postal guys are not a customs broker. Uh, if there's some information on the package, all we're doing is relying on them. It could be, uh, could be fentanyl. It could be something else. There's no data. Thank you very much. Ms. Vandenberg, in your testimony, you point out the limited information that CBB collects from the minimum shipments hinders their enforcement of the Uyghur Force Prevention Act. How can closing the de minimis loophole help CPB to better enforce the, or, uh, enforce the forced labor and other trade statutes? Closing the loophole would give CBP much more insight and much more transparency into goods that are coming in. And it would be much easier to stop goods made with forced labor and Uyghur labor from, from coming into the United States if that loophole were, were modified or closed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I really appreciate uh, the interaction with the, the witnesses. I think the testimony is extraordinarily valuable. I do hope that we reflect on what would happen in things that they're asking us to do if there are dramatic reductions in resources. I hear from each of you, there's more that you want done. And it's not going to be done uh, magically uh, with no investment. I think that's extraordinarily valuable. I do appreciate the notion that there are areas, for example, GSP. We passed GSP renewal. The only adjustment was having provisions dealing with environment uh, and worker protection that are entirely consistent with what we passed in our revised NAFTA legislation that everybody on this committee voted for. So that was all that stood in the way of the enactment of what we've already passed. We agree with your point. We think the thing that we've offered up should not be controversial because everybody agreed with those adjustments that were in the revised NAFTA. So I'm perplexed that GSP is being held hostage because all we're doing is conforming things that this committee has already approved. I appreciate you highlighting it. I hope that's an area that we can also work together on a bipartisan basis and solve a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. It, I found it very useful. Thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. I now recognize, and I will say that we have two votes uh, about, well, two votes on the House floor. Uh, it's my intention to proceed through as many members as possible uh, for questions, and we, uh, pursuant to committee practice, we will now move to two-to-one questioning, beginning with the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Chairman Smith. Mr. Kanko, at a recent field hearing of the Ways and Means Committee at the Port of Staten Island, 
in New York, we heard witness testimony about China's human rights abuses and the fact that products produced by Chinese forced labor still make it to the U.S. market. What steps might Congress take to better enforce the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act? Thanks for the question. Well, in my view, it all starts with transparency. And uh, we're flying blind on air cargo data, which makes up nearly half of the, the value of the products being imported into the U.S. And uh, moreover, makes up a huge percentage of products, high value products, that are associated with, with Uyghur forced labor. So as resources might be reduced at, at CBP, that makes the case for transparency even stronger uh, because the public sector has a role um, in that enforcement process and identifying uh, suspicious shipments or potentially bad actors in the supply chain. And all we can see now is what's coming in by ocean. So, so we have this bizarre distinction between ocean and air when it comes to transparency. And so my view is that that's a, a huge lever we can pull is by expanding transparency to air data and opening up visibility to everyone, not just the government, so we can see what's coming into the country and, and make decisions based on, on the facts. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson, um, I would think it's safe to assume that outdoor sporting products were in, were in demand during the pandemic. What did Vista Outdoors experience tell you about how broken supply chains can impact businesses? For example, how long did it take for a product to get from manufacturer to consumer during this time? And what has the company done to diversify its supply chains since the pandemic? Yeah, great question. So the outdoor industry, it's an $862 billion industry. It grew tremendously during the pandemic, and we certainly were a beneficiary of that. You know, we saw ocean shipping rates, uh, you know, double, triple, quadruple. We utilized air freight uh, more during the pandemic years than we ever have in the history of the country, uh, in the company. Um, GSP has been an incredible tool for us to diversify away from, from China and to give us more exposure from different countries. And the challenge with the inaction on GSP renewal is, you know, our business units are making decisions for the next three, five plus years and not knowing the future of, of GSP in this current environment, you know, leads them to wonder what, what's next? You know, what else can we do? Can these, you know, promises made, are they going to be kept or do we need to look for new solutions? I think the CNL reform that I mentioned in my testimony, you know, being able to raise that threshold with inflation will keep countries that have stood up a GSP capability, it'll keep them in the program longer, which gives us the certainty, um, you know, that again, our long-term planners need. So, Mr. Ferguson, we know countries like China abuse our de minimis trade policies in pushing their products to the U.S. market. What updates would you like to see to the current de minimis policy to avoid such abuse? You know, our, our position is parity for U.S. FTZs. You know, F, there are 197 FTZs in all 50 states, and these are some of the most highly regulated entities in the country. And if we can make the decision that U.S. FTZs are a value additive uh, capability for US distribution, you know, we can funnel and, and put more of these shipments in a place that's regulated, that's overseen by CBP. You know, when it comes to CBP resources, the burden is on the company to maintain your FTZ license. That requires us to check every box, dot every I, cross every T. So regardless of CBP funding, we're gonna do everything we can to stay in compliance and so when it comes to um, you know, forced labor, IP, illicit goods, FTZs is a very effective way to manage those de minimis shipments. And for us, it's a compelling value add where we have an FTZ to correct an inverted tariff for kids' helmet manufacturing, but it can also be a, an amazing tool to expand our DTC capability if we had that parity. Thank you. Mr. Stumo? Um, I'm sure you saw the bipartisan condemnation of the Biden administration's recent decision to enter into a critical minerals agreement with Japan. How does that agreement and potentially another one with the European Union keep America at a global disadvantage, particularly as it relates to our supply chains? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, ag that agreement is uh I guess I'm not prepared to answer that question here today for you, and I, I, uh, I'm just not prepared for that answer. Okay. 
So um, I think something you might be prepared for, let's ask you on this. The Chinese Communist Party is always looking to circumvent and undermine U.S. trade policies. Can you specifically talk about how our current de minimis trade law can be utilized by Chinese companies to avoid additional scrutiny on imports or avoid tariffs altogether, including those in Section 301? Sure. Um, de minimis is, allows 2 million plus packages per day into this country. 62% are from China. It's an explosion of the number of packages. Xi'an and Timu exist solely because of de minimis. A lot of the packages are coming into bonded warehouses in Mexico and Canada, and then are shipped from there into the U.S. There is no data that, is, that we know what the country of origin is of manufacture. We don't know what the HTS code is, which is the number that identifies what's in the package. All we know is it's coming in and it's represented to be under $800. And by the way, that $800 is, means the fair retail price in the country of origin. And the country of origin is China, which is a non-market economy. So everything is coming in uh, through there. You can't, CBP has allowed them to avoid 301 tariffs, our regular duties, our forced labor laws, and a host of, uh, of other laws that you just can't figure out what's going on, much less the narcotics and the counterfeit goods and that sort of thing. So the White House's proclamation allowing imports of unfairly traded solar products from China into the U.S. was rejected by a bipartisan vote here in Congress, actually in this committee as well. Unfortunately, the president vetoed that effort. What signal does the suspension of additional tariffs on China, when we know they are absolutely cheating, send to the Chinese Communist Party? It's, it says that um, we will allow trade cheating. We want cheap stuff at any cost. We don't really care about forced labor. We don't care about dirty coal being used to, use the, to make the panels that take 10 years of, of use to offset the dirty coal that went into them and that will allow the, the whack-a-mole game of them to go to other countries once we find subsidies, allow them to circumvent. And by the way, this 24-year moratorium, and I know there's differences on this committee, of those tariffs is not temporary, it's permanent because they're building wafer plants there in order to comply and not be found to circumvent later so we'll get solar uh, from those countries forever, not just temporarily. And of course, they're building in this country now too. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Buchanan for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all our witnesses for being here today. I want to talk a little bit about IP and the theft of our IP. They estimate it's close to three to six hundred billion from the Chinese, and I'm sure others as well. Uh, my thought is, what ideas or suggestions do you have to better enforce our laws uh, and punish the bad actors. And I'll say, I was there 20 years ago in Beijing, and that was at the top of the list with a business group back then, and they talked about addressing it, and it was just, a lot, to me, it's just been a lot of conversation, nothing much been done. In fact, I think it's got a lot worse in the last 20 years. So I just want to get your thoughts, you know, what would you suggest, what ideas, you know, and uh, Ms. Smith, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, I think I would focus, having done a lot of work in this area at CBP, on the need to continue to partnership, to partner with rights holders. Uh, they have the right expertise and uh, the right focus. Um, and the partnership between the government and the private sector um, to go after those counterfeit goods, I think, has been very productive in the past and should continue to be supportive. Um, with respect to the risks posed by small packages, I would recommend that um, we continue to focus on getting the right data on those small packages so that CBP and other relevant agencies can uh, assess the risk. Um, and in addition, uh, CBP should have the authority to enforce laws on parties outside the United States. Let, let me move on. Mr. Kantko, do you want to add something, your thoughts to that? Uh, because it's a, impacting a lot of jobs in America, and someone mentioned the income statements of a lot of our businesses, and it, it just, you know, it's horrible, I think. And we just got to figure out a better way of minimizing it. 
Yeah, uh, great question. Many of our users are actually using the product to protect their American intellectual property. Uh, so in 1996, Congress did pass the Anti-Counterfeiting Consumer Protection Act, and one component of that was opening up air data to public disclosure. Uh, six months later, that, that piece was strangely uh, neutered in the Technical Corrections Act. Uh, so this has been on, on people's minds for quite a long time. Uh, by opening up air data, these are high value, you know, IP protected goods coming into the country. Uh, big brands and, and little brands alike uh, have a, a right and a reason to protect their IP and, and by not seeing what's coming into the country via air, um, they, they have no idea what, what's coming and what's related to their I trademarks. Wanna, I've got a, another question I want to get to. Mr. Ferguson, you want to add anything to that, how that impacts, you mentioned your income statement, I'm sure the balance sheet is a result. But yeah, not yeah. just you, a lot of companies across America. I, I think upstream, you know, it's, it's a regular part of business. You know, I look at our legal team and, and what they manage in terms of IP theft, uh, it, it's a daily occurrence upstream. Downstream, I would stick to my, my tes testimony. GSP, the, the, the onus is on the, the country uh, to stand up capabilities that protect intellectual property. And I think the more we can, can flow the supply chain to GSP countries, we're doing ourselves a favor. The same is true with FTZs. As I mentioned, they, those are highly regulated entities that have checks, balances, reviews, CBP interactions. Yeah, another question. Ms. Smith, I want to just come back to you real quick. In terms of digital trade flow, they're estimated at $4 trillion uh, this year, according to WTO, 8% growth a year. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this space as well, and people are very concerned about where we're at. Uh, how do we get on top of this? Um, sir, I would tell you, not my area of expertise, as CBP is focused on the physical goods. Mr. Canto, uh, you want anything you want to add to that? Out of our scope. Okay. Mr. Ferguson, anything? Same. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. And now uh, recognize Mr. Higgins for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, something that's in all of our scope is that, you know, trade, the dy dynamic of global trade has changed profoundly in 10 years. There was a time where, you know, the United States uh, deferred to China to make cheap goods, T-shirts, toys, tennis shoes. Uh, now, in the age of technology and electric vehicles, things have changed profoundly. De minimis is uh, pertaining to minimal things. Uh, we are today dealing with very consequential things relative to our economic prosperity as a nation, uh, but also our, our economic security uh, as well. Um, and we're so dependent now on supply chains as we've learned from you know, the manufacturing uh, of electric vehicles. So you're either the country that controls the supply chain, or you're the country that's controlled by the country that controls the supply chain. And I would argue right now, we are not the country that controls the supply chain. So, um, you know, funding for Customs and Border Protection uh, under the debt negotiations, the potential is to reduce agency budgets that may result in Customs and Border protection funding levels being decreased that would diminish the United States' ability to administer and enforce trade laws and protect U.S. workers and domestic industries from unfair trade. There is a proposal for customs modernization. Uh, that plan for customs is the 21st century customs framework. Um, obviously, a change to modernize the framework will cost a lot of money in terms of the implementation. So, Mr. Stumbo, um, St Stumo, I'm sorry, um, your Chief Executive Officer for the Coalition for a Prosperous America, what are your concerns relative to the dynamic of those discussions today and the potential consequences as it relates to customs and border protection modernization? We're focused on making it advantageous to invest, build here, employ workers here. And the customs, uh, our borders with regard to goods, as has been mentioned, it's, it's 
become just lawlessness. And so we have, uh, we have to have the ability to enforce all the trade laws. We, and, it's, and it's not just you know, tariffs and 301 tariffs. It is consumer product safety standards that my members have to abide by, but uh, the imports do not. Um, and you know, look at that number with 532 billion from China last year, plus the 188 from de minimis. We're the bigger export market for them than the next eight countries combined. And how much of that coming back here could make us achieve 5% growth per year, 6% growth? And it starts at the border. We can negotiate whatever we can in the trade agreements, but we have to have the, the data that we have to enforce against forced labor. We have to have the ability to do that quickly without a two-year investigation that never happens. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Thanks. May, may, may I add that Mexico, by the way, has air, land, and sea manifest transparency. Just thank you. Uh, I now recognize Mr. LaHood for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, all of the witnesses for your valuable testimony here today. I wanted um, to talk about a, uh, one particular topic here. Um, proper enforcement mechanisms are a vital part of our U.S. trade policy. We've heard a little bit about that here this morning in protecting Americans from dangerous and illegal goods while still ensuring the flow of trade is efficient and effective and accountable. One important piece of the enforcement conversation is our reliance on goods coming from China. And uh, as we know, there are many bad actors that take advantage of the current system. As we consider policy solutions to strengthen our enforcement procedures, we need to simultaneously be thinking about our relationships with countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including Taiwan. I'd like to focus this morning on the recent USTR announcement of, quote, early harvest negotiations with Taiwan, including a chapter on customs administration and trade facilitation. As a member of this subcommittee and also a member of the Select Committee on China, which is our bipartisan committee focused here in Congress on uh, the strategic competition with China, it's clear to me that strengthening our trade relations with partners in the Indo-Pacific region, including Taiwan, is going to be vital in the coming years to decrease our dependence on China. While I support efforts to assist in the development of the trade relationship, especially given the complexities of Taiwan's presence in the Indo-Pacific and the looming threat of the CCP, it is vital that Congress plays an active and engaged role in the trade relationship. Uh, Ms. Smith, um, are you generally familiar with the customs and trade facilitation chapters from past trade agreements such as USMCA? And if so, can you speak uh, to how some of the provisions may be meaningful to the customs and border protection in its work at U.S. ports? or uh, to American exporters or importers? Thank you for the question, sir. Um, the customs and trade facilitation provisions in free trade agreements typically drive consistency in approach between the U.S. and its trading partners. Um, free trade agreements that drive that consistency and drive uniformity, um, both in port procedures, customs clearance procedures, in, and in regulatory processes are tremendously useful to uh, U.S. multinationals trying to do business in a consistent, harmonized fashion to support better enforcement and better facilitation. And from an enforcement perspective, um, can you share some of your thoughts on our trade relationship with Taiwan and what, um, what that, that should potentially look like as we continue to consider ways to decrease our reliance on goods coming from China? So without specific expertise in Taiwan, I would tell you that um, having um, transparency and awareness of the, the um, requirements in Taiwan um, for U.S. businesses doing business there is, is a good thing um, and will help them make better decisions about where else to source uh, goods as they look to diversify their supply chains. Thank you. Those are all my questions. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, and um, I'll yield five minutes to myself to, uh, for questions. 
Uh, thanks to all our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we're having two trade-focused hearings this month uh, as it demonstrates that Republicans really care about improving and modernizing the way U.S. engages in trade so that the United States can continue to be a leader, which is so important to so many workers, businesses, and families throughout the country. Not only is U.S. trade leadership critical for the health of the American economy, but we've also seen that if we cede our leadership role, our adversaries like China step in. Unfortunately, we've seen absolutely no interest from the Biden administration to engage in trade issues as they treat trade as a second-class issue. While the United States should lead globally on trade, it is Congress who should be leading the way in shaping and advancing our trade practices and agenda. Despite efforts from the Biden administration to try and circumvent Congress, it's the constitutional authority of, of Congress to lead on U.S. trade policy. I think most of my Democrat colleagues would agree that a critical minerals agreement is not actually a trade deal and that trade agreements need to be approved by Congress. But given the debt crisis that President Biden has stumbling through, uh, the, the American negative outlook on the economy, modernizing and updating customs and policies and trade laws will be an important way to help fuel the economic growth. As a representative from Kansas 4th Congressional District, I'm honored to represent farmers and, and ranchers in Kansas. Ag is an important economic industry in my home state. Meat tops Kansas ag exports and, our, and it is our number two overall export commodity for the state at more than $2 billion in 2022. And in the United States, ag exports hit $196 billion in 2022. I recently spoke, spoke with the Harvey County Farm Bureau, uh, a group of highly motivated ag producers in one of the counties in my district who made it clear that market access is one of the keys to helping them thrive, as well as trade enforcement and a robust workforce. Ms. Smith, how will modernizing efforts to support the trade efforts of farmers and ranchers in Kansas and across the country? Thank you for the question. Um, I believe that having um, customs regulations and procedures that reflect the way business is done by those ranchers and farmers who are looking to export and do it um, safely, securely, and compliantly is easier when the rules are clear, the rules are as um, streamlined as possible, um, and that they can also expect that um, the government will enforce um, the laws that protect them from uh, unfair competition. I believe the 21st century customs framework proposals will, will do those things and that CBP is, is looking to partner with Congress to make those changes. Well, thank you. And we've heard a lot about China today. Its use of forced labor and other human rights abuses is deeply troubling for all of us. Even worse, as China accumulates trade partners around the world, it'll increase its use of forced labor to stay competitive and meet demand. If we want to counter China, we must compete from a position of strength. One of the new bills that I introduced with Congressman uh, John Larson would help us innovate and maintain global competitiveness and expand trade opportunities. Uh, the American Innovation and R&D Competitiveness Act would restore immediate R&D expensing for America's innovators and entrepreneurs, making it more favorable for businesses to make investments in research and development and to keep manufacturing and production and jobs here in the United States. Producing more goods in the United States will also lessen our need to rely on some nefarious actors like China. However, not all parts of every good can be sourced here. Uh, Mr. Kanko, how can we increase supply chain transparency to help ensure that even if a product's made here in the United States, uh, we can ensure that none of the composite material or components are tainted or made with slave labor? Uh, great question. Thank you, Representative. Well, by opening up the uh, air manifest data, domestic manufacturers will be able to see first uh, who's importing products similar to what they manufacture. Uh, you start with that in terms of um, you know, benefiting the, the American manufacturer. Once they understand who's consuming products that they make, I think now more than ever, there's a good economic mathematical opportunity for the local supplier to take that business away from the, the foreign supplier. And only with transparent import data can you see the full picture of, of who's doing what. Um, and, and same for various subcomponents of a product. Uh, if your supplier is another American company and they're bringing in part of their uh, supply chain from China or anywhere else, uh, you wouldn't know that now without access to air data. So by complete 
manifest transparency, you'll have access to this valuable information and have a better understanding of, of what components are coming from where. Thank you. And Mr. Ferguson, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so we, we are a manufacturer in the, in the U.S., and, and we make um, stone glacier backpacks in California. We make fishing waders for SEMS in Montana um, and, and other holsters and things. And, and I can tell you that the, the amount of time our compliance team spends in sourcing the source of some of our supply uh, is, is quite intense. And so you talk about the R&D expensing. I also think if we had better supply chain transparency, you know, that generates savings from time not spent by the compliance team, you know, running down this information that could be readily available otherwise. So you kind of have this double effect of becoming more efficient, efficiencies get put back into product, innovation, supply chain diversification. It, it's a true win-win. Yeah, but that's good. I mean, that really is part of the goal of uh, how do we be productive and how do we be uh, competitive, uh, which is really what uh, a free and fair marketplace is about and what we want to do. So uh, thank you. My, my time has expired. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, votes. Uh, there are a couple of votes that we're taking this morning. So I, I, I'm going to recess the committee, uh, and then we will come back after the second vote is finished and, and, uh, and, and take this back up again. I know there's some more questions uh, from all of my colleagues here. So thank you, and uh, I will recess temporarily. I think it will be about 10 to 15 minutes in that time frame. Um, we're about to wrap up the first vote. And so just give you an opportunity for a break and yeah, thank you.
We will come to order. Uh, next, I will recognize Mr. Panetta for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, appreciate you allowing us, uh, indulging us to go vote, so appreciate that break. Um, this obviously is an important hearing um, because customs policy is important, as all of you know, and I think you're getting the sense that all of us up here believe as well. We need it to ensure that we are properly inspecting imports and for reducing forced labor in our supply chains and the products Americans use and consume every single day. To that end, we need visibility into our supply chains, and not just for CBP, but there's outside stakeholders who are also here to help CBP by using trade data to investigate supply chains that may include forced labor, and we must include their voices in that process. So I'm glad they're represented here as well. Now, obviously, one of the areas of forced labor has to be in the um, realm of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, which happens, as many of you know, on the high seas all around the world and really taints our supply chains. Even worse, it facilitates, like I said, forced labor, especially for migrant workers, and there is little oversight of many vessels engaging in IUU fishing. Ms. Ms. Vandenberg, what actions could CBP take right now to increase costs for companies that import seafood that engages in IUU fishing or forced labor? There, sorry. Thank you, Congressman Panetta, for this question. It's, it's really excellent. I think there are two things that could happen. One is we need more withhold release orders. There are petitions pending. We need withhold release orders on IUU fishing issues where there is forced labor in that supply chain. The second point I would make is that we have called for additional findings by CBP, which is a higher standard. We've asked for additional findings. And we have also asked CBP to fine companies that are importing goods made with forced labor into the United States. To date, there's only been one fine. It was quite low. We'd like to see far more fines in order to make this less profitable. And is there anything that Congress can do to make CBP uh, a little bit, uh, anything that we can do to help crack down on bad actors? Congressman, I think this is all a question of resources. This is not the time to obliterate the CBP budget for forced labor enforcement. It's time to increase it, because I do feel that with increased resources, they would be able to crack down more. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, moving from uh, sea onto land, obviously uh, there are illicit drugs that cross our border, especially through ports of entry. Now, obviously, there aren't packages that are marked can, that they contain deadly drugs, and they need to be screened. But we cannot, as we're learning and as we know, we cannot screen every package. So we need to get smarter about where drugs are coming from and where they are going. Uh, Mr. Kenko, um, how can additional transparency help outside stakeholders track potential drug shipments and prevent, help prevent the illicit drug trade? Great question. Um, and, and we're working on uh, some stories with the media on this exact issue right now. Uh, of course, packages don't arrive with a, a loud uh, sign saying fentanyl, but fentanyl precursors, for example, um, which consist of quite a number of, of chemicals which are always changing, you know, those are typically labeled with some honesty. Um, most of that comes in by air, so we see none of it now, none of that is available to, uh, to the public. Um, but having access to air data, being able to see the flow of these fentanyl precursors, not, not all of which, of course, are, are going into fentanyl, many of them are, are used for benign purposes, um, but having better eyes on what that universe looks like, and then from there being able to tease out the suspicious shipments it would be a massive benefit of having access to air cargo manifest data. Great, thank you. And I got one more area I want to hit on, and Mr. Kenko, I'm going to go to you. Obviously, um, we've hit Russia with severe sanctions. However, without being able to track supply chains, we won't know who is abiding by those sanctions and who is. Um, how can trade data transparency help us track who is abiding by those sanctions policy and who is violating them? Uh, well, one simple answer would be uh, what we would do or what users of our data would do is is watch for spikes in categories of products um, that are against the norm. And when you see a pattern like that, the, the next layer of analysis would be, you know, is this 
behavior happening to circumvent uh, a typical trade flow between a sanctioned country or a sanctioned product category uh, to get around that and, and still accomplish the endpoint delivery. Uh, so, so trade data can be used in, in any number of ways to, uh, to find sanctions violators, and, and we recently helped uh, expose some of that. Great. Thanks to all the witnesses. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Miller from West Virginia for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Ship. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and thank you all for being here today. A lot has changed since we obviously passed the last customs modernization bill. And I, have, I really view in my job here is to ensure that the United States companies can be competitive in the global market. We've got to empower American ingenuity here in Washington, but not dampen it with all of the outdated rules and laws that we're finding. From a time that was largely pre-internet, the way we trade with our partners has changed drastically. I know we've discussed that for the last hour. And we need to make sure that our agencies have the tools that they need to hold China and other bad actors accountable, collect required duties, and ensure that the goods that are made with slave labor and human right abuses do not reach our market. Mr. Ferguson, as an apparel, I'm sorry, yeah, as an apparel and recreational goods manufacturer, I'm sure that you source products and inputs from all over the world. Can you explain the importance of the GSP and how it plays for your company, especially when attempting to build supply chains outside of China? Yeah, GSP is critical. You know, the 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 financial reward that our teams can realize from utilizing GSP are material. And it's enough to, to stand up uh, new supply chains, to leave supply chains that our teams have, have developed over decades in China, but it is worth it. But the key is, you know, the promises made, you know, will promises be kept? And thus far, $2.5 billion are still hanging out there that we have to carry on our income statement uh, quarter after quarter. Um, I think, you know, one point that, that's a positive <coughs> data point, since travel goods were added to GSP in 2017, $5 billion has migrated out of China. So I think there's, there's a lot of compelling points that support uh, the GSP works. Uh, but for our teams that are thinking in three and five year chunks, you know, we need certainty on GSP. And, and right now that certainty is, is, is in question. That's so often what I hear from businesses is they just want certainty. Ms. Smith, our country is facing a challenging economic climate and I'm concerned about raising any taxes on small businesses and consumers who are already having trouble buying everyday goods and services. While there's been controversy surrounding this topic, can you explain your perspective on how the elimination of the de minimis threshold would have impact on the overhead for small businesses and how those costs are passed down to everyday customers, consumers who are already struggling with inflation? A wonderful question, and it really exposes a fairly complex dynamic. Uh, the rise of e-commerce has really been a boon to small and medium-sized businesses, and it has really driven a tremendous economic prosperity in a particular segment of the market. Um, I think one of the things that the government can do working um, to support small, medium-sized businesses is to make sure that processes are streamlined and clear so that the business that they are conducting is compliant, it is safe to consumers, but it also allows them to earn a, a, a living. Of course, so many of us have already today talked about the current de minimis threshold as a loophole is there anything that you want to add about that, about the Chinese companies taking advantage? Earlier, I referenced the need for the right data from the right parties. And I think in the de minimis environment, one of the reason that CBP and the other regulatory agencies are somewhat blindfolded is because they don't have the right data from the parties in the supply chain. I think that's absolutely critical, and I think the other thing, and it's been talked about a number of times today, is that CBP have the resources to enforce on yes. that huge tide of small packages. Yes. Thank you so much. Mr. Kanko, last year, 
Congress appropriated over $100 million to Customs and Border Patrol to implement the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Do you have views on how the CBP could better work with private industry to ensure that forced labor products never enter the U.S.? Sure. Um, well, as you know, oftentimes enforcement actions actually start with a, a tip or uh, an insight from the public sector. And oftentimes that comes from manifest transparency of which we can only see ocean shipments at the moment. Uh, so by expanding trade transparency to include air, uh, you'll, you'll essentially double um, the amount of shipments that are now visible and the public, NGOs, the media, businesses, can, can scour that data and find clues and, and bring those, surface those to law enforcement, including CBP, uh, who can then identify the, um, the more suspicious looking shipments and investigate and take action. That, I've seen that happen time and time again where an enforcement action starts with the public side and what does the public have access to? Only publicly available data. So I think transparency is one answer there and it's, it's a big one. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. I next recognize for five minutes, Mr. Smucker from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, I um, enjoyed hearing about VISTA um, and um, heard uh, some of the problems you were faced with uh, with the minimus, uh, particularly with an FTC. And uh, recently I had heard from a Pennsylvania company that's in a very um, similar circumstance, and that's uh, David's Bridal, uh, which has traditionally been sort of a brick and mortar a company where a you know, bride can go in and try on the dress and, uh, and touch it and feel it. Um, and they're faced with uh, you know, all of the same market uh, factors that uh, brick and mortar companies are faced with today, where more and more is going online and so on and so forth. But they also have the FTZ issue, which really puts them, um, and the Dominus, which, which puts them on a, it's not a level playing field with companies from China, which is their, uh, their, their primary um, challenge and primary competitor. So I think in a lot of ways it's similar to, to, um, to, to what, you've ex what you've experienced. Um, and again, uh, you know, I, I think we've got to innovate to, to meet the market, but you know, it'd be sad to see a company like David's that still is important uh, to many brides um, you know, not be able to operate um, any longer. Um, and particularly if it's due to our laws, um, making it easier for a company from China to sell directly to, to consumers. And so um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, you know, they have this another issue where a lot of their products are just simply copied by uh, foreign online retailers, and they've even uh, uh, told us that you know, uh, it goes as far as they'll put a marketing piece online, and that same day it shows up on another site. The exact uh, you know work that they've done in the marketing piece. I'm wondering if you've had experience with um, sort of your brands in, in that regard, and if so, what uh, recourse uh, do you have through CPB to prevent um, you know, that sort of ripping off designs or marketing and so on from entering the market in the first place? Yeah, we do. You know, we're, we're the largest helmet um, company in the U.S. We operate through Bell Helmets, Giro, and Fox Racing. Uh, any of the helmets that you see that have Minnie Mouse ears or you know, a dragon tail, those are also our helmets. Sure. Now, when, when those products are ripped off, not only is it a, is it a you know, financial hit, but it's a safety issue in major ways. Because uh, helmets, as, as simple as they may look, are, are extremely engineered, a lot of innovation. And so, you know, I guess my first answer is it's our legal team. I mean, they're, they're the ones who are going to, to pull the levers to fight that fight through the, the legal system, both US and, and foreign. Um, you know, there's different mechanisms to file grievances and complaints with CBP, but it's got to be kind of an all-hands-on-deck situation. Sure. But back to the FTZs, I just think there's an amazing opportunity to make the very simple decision that e-commerce distribution can be more concentrated in the United States by bringing parity to FTZs. Yes. And through that, every FTZ, you know, has an exhaustive licensing requirement, oversight process, integration with CBP that inevitably can fix and, and create these issues of illicit goods, IP issues, sure. compliance. 
Uh, so I think that has to be part of the solution as well. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a, it's a compelling argument. It's a change that I think uh, that I think we need to make. So hopefully we get that done. And I, I wanted to go to Ms. Smith just uh, very briefly, uh, briefly as we um, as we consider uh, customs modernization legislation. I'm just curious to get your practices uh, or get uh, practices that we can borrow. Uh, from our trading partners on customs fac uh, facilitation. Uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Stumo's testimony included a recommendation to borrow from Mexico's uh, shipment transparency uh, requirements. I also know some of our partners, for instance, like Singapore, almost entirely uh, automated um, in their port operations. And so during your tenure at CBP, uh, which partners stood out for having some of that cutting edge uh, customs facilitation practices and what were some of the practices that we can potentially adopt. Well, I like to think that here in the U.S. we actually are, are um, one of the, the world leaders. But um, we did work with many countries around the, the world. Singapore uh, comes to mind. Um, our Border 5 partners, um, Australia and New Zealand in particular, um, were, were great partners, but also had some good ideas for us to work with. Um, I think the idea that we leverage trusted traders, those of us that have invested heavily in, in compliance, we're good corporate citizens and can, in fact, be compliant, is something that, that the government needs to recognize and leverage. Thank you. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for yielding and for holding this important hearing. Um, look, forced labor, a term which is really a euphemism for modern slavery, uh, is, is far too prevalent. Uh, but it's not just detrimental to the people that are impacted by it, those who are exploited, but it undercuts American workers, undercuts American companies. I've been focused on this um, and, and want to continue to to work to make sure that we're effectively enforcing against this. I happen to represent a company called Hemlock Semiconductor. They make polysilicon, a base material for solar panels, but also for semiconductors. And for years, Hemlock Semiconductor was losing market share to Chinese companies. They shuttered a multi-billion dollar investment in the U.S. even before it was operational, because they could not compete with slave labor. Working with NGOs, and human rights organizations, we provided information to CPV, my office, showing U.S. workers and domestic companies that were manufacturing polysilicon were being undercut by forced labor in Xinjiang province. Knowing this information, I worked with my colleagues on this committee to encourage um, a, a withhold release order, or WRO, even with the overwhelming evidence, which was just right in their face. It took CPB almost a year to issue that WRO for polysilicon, which is way too long. Once it was issued, we saw an immediate increase in demand for polysilicon from domestic production, particularly from the people that I represent. Hundreds of workers had their jobs restored. So starting with Mrs. Vandenberg, I wonder if you um, can talk about how we can use, improve the use of civil society organizations and their involvement with CPB to remove forced labor from our supply chains? Thank you, Congressman Kildee. It's an, it's an excellent question. I would start with cargo transparency, because non-governmental organizations, often at great risk to themselves, do these investigations abroad. But we can only see what's coming in on ocean freight. We cannot see any of the other modes of transportation. And so it undercuts our ability to do the kind of petitions that you and your colleagues did in the polysilicon case. The, the second thing I would say is that there needs to be quicker adjudication. We have CBP looking at petitions for far too long. There needs to be quicker adjudication of all of these petitions so that the withhold release orders can be enforced. Thank you. Uh I think also, just since the passage of the Uyghur Forced uh, Labor Protection Act, polysilicon products from Xinjiang are technically banned from the U.S. unless it can be proven that they're not made with forced labor. Uh, we are concerned, many of us, that there are still polysilicon connected to Xinjiang entering the U.S. We've also heard similar concerns about textiles. 
being made uh, in Xinjiang using the same sort of forced labor uh, entering the U.S. So I wonder, uh, Mr. Vandenberg, if you might comment on what CPB can do better. And I know resources, you mentioned that in, in response to Mr. Panetta's question. Resources are one aspect of it. But is there anything else that we should be for, uh, uh, in, in encouraging? And uh, if, you, if Ms. Vandenberg, you could offer a comment, and then Mr. Stumo, if you might comment as well. Absolutely. We are all concerned that the entity list for the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is so short and truncated. Dr. Laura Murphy has done enormous amounts of research on companies that should be on the entity list, which have not been added. So we would ask that CBP increase that list to better reflect companies that have tainted forced labor from the Xinjiang region. Thank you. Still? Forced labor in China is unique. It's state-sponsored by Beijing. It's genocide, which has been found by two administrations. And all of the, the, the labor, transfer, uh, labor transfer program, the poverty alleviation program, all the subparts are by Beijing. This is not something where forced labor is in the outskirts of an economy and they just fail to stamp it out. For the Uyghur Forced Labor, the UFLPA, for the goods with the origin of China should be presumed to be forced labor overall and then have a licensor to show that they're not. It's very hard, enforcement is so slow, as you've said, and even improving it is fantastic, but it's too slow, they move very rapidly and there's a very high volume. I appreciate that, and I know we don't have time for it perhaps right now, Mr. Stumo, if you wouldn't mind sharing with my office some of the information that you made reference to. I have the concern about the 24-month pause on the, uh, the, the solar tariffs. You mentioned, as I have felt for a long time, this is not a 24-month problem. This has a long-term implication, and I would certainly want to have as much data as possible to, to make that case where we can. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak further on that. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. I now recognize Dr. Murphy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you guys of the committee for sticking it out on a fly-out day when we have votes and everything. But your, uh, your input is deeply, deeply appreciated. You know, I, I, as I sit in Congress more and more and more and talk with uh, individuals, it is an absolute um, statement, I think, that, um, that can be made is that we are at war with China. The only problem is they understand it and we don't. And we're allowing their practices, um, their forced labor practices, their, um, their cheating at trading to undermine this country's national security and um, we support the human rights abuses. I, I really wish, and I've said this many, many times, uh, that we need to divest out of China. I think our colleges and universities who pushed five years ago, 10 years ago to divest out of fossil fuels should have the same moral outrage to divest out of China and stop their uh, murderous and, in fact, murderous practices um, and cheating and undermining the freedom of our society. I, I don't understand why we don't do this. So um, anyway, that's a little bit off my hinge. Um, so our trade policy and supply chains have come under increased focus during the pandemic. I mean, we saw that exploited, especially, I'll just take a little sidetrack, especially in medicine. Uh, we have two months supply if, God forbid, um, we get blocked off from China. Two months supply. Uh, we don't know what's coming from China because our FDA is not looking at it. Um, we're getting generics across this country that have not been inspected by our own FDA. Yesterday, um, we voted to override the president's veto on the CRA that would have prevented the Biden administration from waiving tariffs on the Chinese solar panels. Sadly enough, we were not successful. Um, I personally think we're giving, again, giving the, the kitchen sink to China. Um, Mr. Stoma, what type of message do you think it sends both to domestic manufacturers as well as the Communist Party, because they're watching everything we do, that President Biden is declaring an emergency declaration, even though his own Department of Commerce showed that China was cheating our laws to the detriment of the United States worker? Of course, it's, it shows that we're just not serious about our trade laws. We're not serious about building back better. Uh, as you know, Mr. Congressman, uh, one of our chief geopolitical rival in the 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, as to the Soviet Union, determined that he needed to cut off 
uh, trade and capital markets, so we were not funding the Soviet Union's uh, geopolitical aims. And by cutting them off from the financial markets, as you mentioned before, which we provide about two or three trillion to China through their integration in our financial markets and our pension funds, as well as our goods trade deficit, which is not just 320 billion a year, but it's another 188 because of de minimis. No one else in the world funds China like we do. Nowhere close. The Europeans don't, the Japanese don't, the Germans, nobody. It's us. And we have to, for all our talk, we're building their military and we're building their ability to invade Taiwan. And it's because we can't figure out that we need to build and make stuff here and employ our people and get our profits. I, I, I think, you know, in the almighty pursuit of everything green, we're willing to do exactly what you just said with China, build their military, build their infrastructure for an incremental change in any CO2 emissions while they build two new coal plants a week. I mean, again, on every single front. But we do it greener than they do. Right, so right, and I, I just don't green. get it. I just yeah. don't get it. Well, why are we now basically um, supplanting the economy of our world's greatest, and I'm just gonna say flat out enemy. We just don't have a ballistic war yet, but we're seeing every, everything, everything else. Uh, Mr. Kanka, I'll try to hurry up. To what degree can import genius um, help detect future incidents of countries circumventing tariffs um, by sending products through other countries? We know this is an extensive problem. How can we help? How can we stop it? Uh, the, the more transparency, the better. We do collect manifest data uh, from a number of countries, not just the U.S., uh, 17 countries now. So you can sometimes, fairly often, connect the dots when a shipment is taking a uh, circuitous route to the ultimate destination, and you can detect um, you know, circumvention efforts that way. Uh, but the more countries, the better, and the more transparency per country, the better. The thing we can do here is open up access to air data, which will double the visibility for United States, shipments coming into the United States. Thank you. I I'll just make one more statement. With the whole de minimis argument, Guys, we're talking about the opioid epidemic and the absolute war that China, again, has created on our streets, killing 110,000 Americans last year. All these things that are getting under $800 and there's no way they can be inspected, this is an absolute portal for the illicit fentanyls to come into the country. We have to stop that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. I'll next recognize uh, Ms. Fischbach for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And. Um, I appreciate you all being here, and like everyone has said, kind of putting up with our weird schedule, so I appreciate that. Um, but Mr. Kinko, um, in your testimony, you mentioned the bipartisan Moving America's Privacy Prevention Act, um, which recently passed the Senate through unanimous consent. Um, I would like to submit for the record um, a letter from the lead co-sponsor in the House of this legislation, Congressman Michael Walls from Florida. Thank you. Without objection. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the bill, but if enacted, this bill would help reduce the risk that personal information, such as Social Security and passport numbers, would be inadvertently disclosed amongst commercial trade data. Um, can you explain to me um, how private information ends up in the hands of the data companies like Import Genius and how this bill could help? So it's a bit of a messy process, the way the, the data is currently collected and disseminated by the government, by customs. Um, we do the best we can to create algorithms that detect and automatically suppress shipments that might be of a personal nature and might reveal some uh, personal identifiable information. And um, our competitors, uh, the good ones, do that as well. But it's much more efficient and, and much more thorough to have that process done at the government level. And so we, we fully support that bill. Uh, occasionally, personal shipments do get caught up in the commercial data set. It's frustrating. Um, that's not what I mean when I say transparency. We don't want to or need to see those personal shipments, and, and we fully support that effort. Thank you. And now shifting gears a little bit, you men mentioned transparency. Um, uh, the CPB plays a critical role in both the prevention of and the response to foreign animal diseases. Um, interfacing with the USDA on biological threats to our agricultural sector. In your testimony, you mentioned case examples of Import Genius helping to identify and track contaminated agricultural products throughout the supply chain. 
Uh, do you believe that increased transparency in import data will help CPB better protect our domestic industry from in this regard? Oh, absolutely. I mean, once you have some clues, you use trade data, uh, you work backwards from the, the clues and you look at trade data to see where similar products may have also been recently shipped. And, and that can allow you to actually intervene in almost in real time and make a difference in the outcome. Can't do that now if it came in by air. And, uh, you know, because animal disease outbreaks <clears throat> affect American farmers' ability to export their products around the world, do you agree that this increased transparency will have an added effect of not just protecting our domestic industry, but also helping to protect American access to export markets? Oh, clearly, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, and I'll yield back. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Mr. Kustoff from Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. Uh, Ms. Smith, if I could with, with you, first of all, uh, thank you for your long public service uh, to our nation. I can, it seems to me that uh, we've all talked about this, that CBP is, is governed by very few timelines when it, uh, when it pertains to re responding to certain inquiries, such as petitions and protests from stakeholders or customs rulings, penalty determinations. Seems to me that that has real world effects, that that, that really can cause something. I think without a doubt it does create uncertainty for our businesses logistically, for planning purposes. Your opinion, should the CBP be subject to stricter re requirements for timelines for responding to certain trade actions and inquiries? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, as a former government official, um, I recognize my responsibility to be responsive to the American public. Um, having um, res uh, quick service, Responsive service um, is very important, but I also recognize that um, asking um, for faster service um, means that you put more resources on that particular right. issue. If you don't have the resources, you're trying to squeeze blood from a stone. And um, I think it's a matter of priorities and if, in fact, it, while CBP meets many deadlines with the Enforcement Protect Act, with their rulings benchmark and other things, I think it is incumbent upon um, both the Congress and other stakeholders to communicate to CBP what the priorities are. Fair, fair enough. Let me ask you this in a, in a broader context. During your time at uh, CBP, can you think of any specific situations where the lack of a required timeline or deadline caused problems, that there wasn't a defined timeline? None come to mind. But what do come to mind are the multitude of cases where there are um, requirements around timelines, whether it is enforcing anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders, running the um, Enforce and Protect Act evasion process, um, issuing le the multitude of less complex rulings. Um, I do know in um, that having new timelines mandated by legislation does put a significant amount of pressure on the agency, but it also, in the Enforce and Protect Act case, did have the desired result. Let me, one more question on that, on that line. Would, the, would stricter timelines for CBP, could it prevent supply chain disruptions and bottlenecks? Would it help or would it alleviate it? So I think having additional predictability is always helpful to the private sector, something that, that they can count on. I'm not sure that it would resolve supply chain congestion. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, 
uh, that uh, CBP for several years has proposed legislation to establish a new global trade specialist, uh, that a position within the agency. In the last Congress, both the Senate and the House passed bills to grant CBP this authority. It was not enacted uh, into law. A couple questions. One, are you familiar with the proposal? And if you are, could that change be useful to improve CBP's enforcement efforts? Absolutely. I'm both familiar. Okay. Um, it actually developed under my watch, um, so I am a huge supporter. Um, I think any time we can invest in our trade personnel, particularly um, the non-uniformed trade experts, um, the attorneys, the auditors, the analysts that do a lot of the customs compliance work is absolutely critical. Global Trade Specialist allows the agency to um, hire and recruit and retain for modern skills like analytics, the management of data, um, things that are critical tools in good trade enforcement and facilitation. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Moore from Utah for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for keeping us on time. Uh, thank you, witness, for being here. I, I appreciate Ranking Member Blumenauer's comments right the, f the first. We highlighted some of the statistics on the burden of what we go through with our customs protections and, and the work that you do. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, and it's a tall order. I think we all recognize that. And, um, and as with the globalized economy, like we're requiring more and more from CB, CBP than ever before. Um, then add the pandemic. So this is a big, big, big task. And I think we all, we all understand that. Utah, in Utah, we're innovating in, in, to maintain our place as we call ourselves the crossroads of the West. Um, trade matters to us. Efficiency matters to us. And, uh, and we're pushing really hard to, to execute a bold vision to establish an inland port authority. And it's been a big undertaking. And, um, and, I, and, and, I want, and I want folks from anybody, any stakeholder involved with this to recognize there is a big problem. There is a huge task ahead, and we're trying to do it the most efficient way possible. Maybe sometimes operating as usual isn't the best way to continue to go forward. Like think big, think outside the box. Um, and you know, Utah has always tried to, to, to be a part of this. We're very proud to represent Box Elder County um, in the 1869 completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, where they, where they, where they drove the final golden spike. Right? And uh, this matters to our community, and we're trying to add to the nation's problem here and, and really fix, and fix this issue. A question from Ms. Smith. Um, as, we look to, as this committee looks for ways to modernize, you know, do you believe that inland ports you know, meet our objectives, sort of our shared objectives to improve trade fac facilitation, minimize supply chain bottlenecks, and, and even as we interact uh, in the future with, with China and holding them accountable, is this, is this a feasible path we'd be considering this? Congressman, I think it's a very interesting suggestion. Um, I think any time that you, you can locate a government service close to its constituents is probably a good thing, even with the advances we've had in, in working remotely. Um, one of the challenges, I do believe, in establishing new ports or new places for CBP to be is, is um, not only having the resources, but also having the infrastructure to support. And so, so it, it does come back to not only the bodies, well-trained and present, but also the information systems, the building that have to be there as well. And as I've been close to this, you've actually answered my second question and highlighting that unique need. Um, as I've been close to this, that is Utah's concern. We are focused on making sure that we have the proper infrastructure and building it into a strategic plan that works. Um, so I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to highlight, we have a massive problem as, as, as a ranking member highlighted as well, and I agree with, and this is a significant um, step in the right direction on solving some of this. And so um, thank you for that and look forward to, to continue to work together. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, um, we got a minute and a half here to solve a very big issue with some questioning. Uh, it's great to see you. You've done you work here before. You're, you're familiar with Capitol Hill. Uh, feel, feel, please feel at ease to answer this question candidly. Do you feel like sometimes we talk big and 
and we don't always put, put action towards something? Never. Perhaps. Never. <laughs> we do. Um, GSP is an opportunity of, for us to follow up on what we're trying to do. Everybody knows, and every thought, every, every thought player, every stakeholder, every member of Congress, every international trade expert, they recognize that, you know, we're gonna have, we're gonna have strife with China going forward. It's gonna continue. We saw what happened in, in the pandemic. Like, this is not something that we can just bury our head in the sand and deal with. So the, 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 the main two thoughts on this is how in the world as a nation do we de-risk from the potential looming threat, particularly in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Straits? How do we de-risk and also to what extent do we decouple? There's different thoughts on decoupling, but everybody agrees we need to de-risk. De in order to decouple smartly, we have to incentivize other partners to provide goods and services to our nation. We can't survive without it. Is GSP a good opportunity to meet that objective? And do you have anything else that's that actionable as far as like, the, the, like GSP? It, it is a great diversification tool. And since travel goods was added to GSP in 2017, there's been $5 billion migrated out of China. And so there, there's no shortage of ideas. There should be more ideas. But this is something concrete. It's at our fingertips. And let's, let's invest in it and let's create certainty and make this a program that the private sector can plan on, not only just for the upcoming quarter, but you know, five, 10 years down the road. And you hit the point that I wanted to make with the time I don't have. We've got to be consistent with these players and these companies that are willing to engage in it and they're willing to, 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 to go the direction we're trying to push them. We have to be consistent with them. And I'm hopeful that we were able to get it done this year. I'm frustrated we didn't last year, but I want to get it done this year. Thank you so much, and thanks for being so bold in your first question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Steele from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all the witnesses today. I represent Southern California, and my congressional district is in close proximity to the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, the nation's largest port gateway. These two Ports have been on the front line of supply chain crisis and progressive policies enacted at the state level and now dealing with work disruption. We must ensure that ports are safe, secure, and ready to compete with other ports around the world. One area that impacts California is the illegal smuggling of drugs off our coast and our cities. CBP air and marine officers have been asking Congress to double their area of operation from 12 to 24 nautical miles off our nation's coast, <clears throat> which is consistent with international law <clears throat> and is to target drug smugglers who know knowingly operate outside of CBP's 12 mile range of route like Mexico to California. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd love to submit the record, this letter from Congressman Mike Watts of Florida, who is read legislation to help target drug smugglers that operate off our coast. Without objection. Thank you. Mrs. Smith, um, what other tools that can Congress give CBP to help target? drug traffickers like this custom water legislation and deadly fentanyl. Thank you for the question. Uh, unfortunately, it's not my area of expertise, but if you would allow me to submit something for the record, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Any witnesses that you can, yes, please. We've obviously been talking about de minimis before, but that's exactly where a lot of this fentanyl is coming through. And uh, I did actually, uh, my, uh, Ms. Smith, I did find some of your <laughs> testimony actually from uh, 2017 where, the, where you spoke to the Senate Finance Committee about a raid uh, at New York on the small package blitz. And 43% uh, of the packages inspected were non-compliant, but they seized five pounds of fentanyl which I did the calculation is 2.2 million milligrams, which a few milligrams of fentanyl can kill. 
So uh, they found about 800 counterfeit goods and 1,300 other non-compliant imports. But uh, forgive me for quoting you, Ms. Smith, but, I, but it was a good quote. It's a good statement. Uh, transnational, uh, from Ms. Smith's testimony, transnational criminal organizations are shipping illicit goods to the United States via small packages due to a perceived lower interdiction risk and less severe consequences if the package is interdicted. Thank you so much. And actually, I have another question for Ms. Smith. You mentioned the CBP has recommendations to update our customs laws. Are these areas in which CBP may be lagging other nations when it comes to facilitating legitimate trade and modernizing trade enforcement? And how might updates to our customs laws improve CBP's coordination with private sector traders? It's a great question, and I think it really calls out the opportunities. I believe that in the U.S. we are a world leader in trade facilitation and trade enforcement, um, but th there is always more that can be done. And I would call out particularly two areas. One, um, the coordination not only be within Customs and Border Protection, but with the other government agencies that regulate goods crossing our border. There are 50 other agencies that participate in the U.S. single window automation effort. So 50 agencies that have interest and requirements. Those requirements are not coordinated, nor is the data that each agency collects. And there is a huge opportunity there to reduce cost and improve coordination. I think the second area that, as a U.S. government, we can do to facilitate and enforce is to recognize the investment and compliance that many U.S. businesses have made and streamline their entry into the United States so that government agencies can focus on the truly bad actors. Thank you so much. Uh, during the supply chain crisis, I went out to the ports and we did a tour and there are so many agencies that they are working separately and they never work together. So one of my bill actually passed under Coast Guard bill and they have to work together. So hopefully that we can expand that. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm not member of trade but subcommittee, but you know what? I really enjoy these meetings and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I now recognize for five minutes Mr. Arrington from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we had votes called and coming in and out of the committee hearing is not ideal. I, I'm sure people have asked similar questions. And I apologize in advance if uh, this is duplicative, but thank you for your time and your input. I've got one philosophical question for Ms. Vanderberg. Um, I appreciate the concerns that we all share about forced labor and you in particular in your organization. By the way, I hope they're equally concerned with the human trafficking that's happening at our southern border because in part I think our nation's policies have made us complicit because we've empowered the human traffickers to do that. And that's a separate issue. I don't want to be that guy that goes off track here, but you know, China cheats they steal, they manipulate currency, they steal IP, they send spy balloons uh, to collect data from military installations, they collect data on our children. They are our biggest adversarial threat and they are the worst human rights violators and yet we work so hard to try to have this reciprocal trade partnership. It just, I'm perplexed by that relationship. Just absent, we hold a different standard for China than we do Cuba and other countries. We, we, we can be indignant about these things that you care about and I care about when it's another country that has a small market, but if it's a big market, and listen, I'm speaking against some of my own uh, district interests that I have the largest cotton patch in the world. We. We make more cotton in a 100-mile radius of Lubbock, Texas, around Lubbock, Texas, uh, than any cotton-producing region in the world. And our number one market is China. 
So I'm, I'm talking against this interest for a minute. I mean, what should our policy be with China? What, what is our principle? What are our prevailing views? What are the goals we're trying to achieve? Because it's not working. Um, I'll just leave it there and let you all respond. Are you equally perplexed by this? Or is it just that complicated of a relationship, Mr. S Mr. Stumo? Thank you. It's uh, <laughs> we, we we it's like Groundhog Day. We tried this, you know, in WTO, letting China in, where they were going to, you know, we we're going to trade with them. They're going to be an open, democratic, capitalistic economy. They've gone the different way. That's totally been false. We did it with Russia. They were going to be open, democratic, capitalistic. They invaded Crimea and now of Ukraine. So it doesn't work. And uh, with China, it's totally non-reciprocal. We just we just. We have a country that we, we like to consume cheap stuff uh, rather than produce stuff. Uh, the Germans, the Japanese, the South Koreans, they focus on production there. They don't focus on production somewhere else with their allies. And by the way, allies are, you know, fair weather friends. We have conflicting interests, you yes. know, one day versus another. But they focus on there. They dominate their home market and then export. We can't even dominate our home market because we don't produce enough to even fulfill our home market. Wow. The trade is the tail, the production is the dog. We've got to focus on the dog. In China, we can't buy Chinese land. We can't buy Chinese stock in Chinese companies. We can't put our Lincoln Institutes into their universities. They put their Confucius Institutes in our universities. They don't allow our de minimis goods in there. And if they do allow somebody in there, we're out in a few days, but they steal our IP and then they ship it back to us and we don't even inspect it because it comes back in our de minimis shipments. So, and we are funding their rise, we're funding their military, we're funding their ability to invade Taiwan. Other countries are not. There is no other country that can absorb the excess production of China like they're not, nobody's big enough and stupid enough like we are. The Japanese, the EU, nobody does it, it's us. That is the best, most comprehensive response to that question since I've been a United States Congressman and been on this committee. The only thing you missed is the fact that we are also underwriting their policies and programs uh, because we borrow from them and we pay them a tremendous amount of interest and that interest is going up. Uh, last point in eight seconds, let's see if I can do this. Anybody can take this on. We, I heard my colleagues say, it's not authority, it's capacity. How in the world are we going to modernize and allow CBP to do their job to facilitate commerce and protect us from uh, terrorism and other things in terms of their safety and security mission when they're overwhelmed and overrun by an open, chaotic, lawless border? I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman. W would you indulge one of the witnesses to just try to answer that? Yes. Thank you. I, I would just like to make the point that the, the, the China issue, of course, is complicated, but how can these decisions even be made when, uh, for example, right now in dozens of airports throughout the United States, shipments, cargo shipments coming in from China and elsewhere are, are coming in blind. We have no idea who's, the, pu the public has no idea who is importing these shipments, what's in the boxes. Um, until we have complete trade transparency, uh, we have a big blind spot in terms of what's happening with China and what's being imported into the U.S. and by whom. Thank you. How about the shipment of synthetic opioids from across the border in the illicit opioid trade? But anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been very indulgent and patient with me. And it's because you have the, it's because you claim to have the largest agriculture district in America. And I'm, I'm going to Data-driven. Data-driven. <laughs> Data Thank you all. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Thank you to our witnesses for your insight, uh, for your expertise. Uh, I, I think it's been a very uh, thoughtful exchange. I appreciate uh, all the members' participation. Uh, these are issues we need to address, and so we look forward to further input. And uh, please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the, the subcommittee stands adjourned.